So we're going to start with number three, which is your stunt woman question. All right, so right on over to these. And definitely going to need a calculator again. All right, so this says that a stunt woman falls from a 1,000 foot building and is oftentimes moving to her speed increases by 32 feet per second for each second that she is falling. Okay, so for each one, you're going to have to say we keep adding on that 32. So what does a person who models her distance on the ground at two seconds? If a woman is falling, what did we classify this as yesterday? What type of model? Flat grounded. Yeah, anything with like a projectile or a fall or something with a gravitational constant, which is what the 32 feet per second is, is going to be a quadratic model. So this is a quadratic model. Again, anytime you see falling, projectile, rocket launch, those are your most common, et cetera. So something that deals basically with um, motion. This is your motion model. Do we have enough information to find a model for the situation? We do. We're going to create one. So your stunt woman, so we have an initial value here of 1,000. So I'm going to use this space right here. So I'm going to say time. And we will say our height here, which was feet. Time and your feet. So initially, so she's just standing there. She hasn't fallen yet. So I'm going to go zero. And what height is she at? Exactly, 1,000. And then this in a minute will go into your calculator. Now, kind of like what we did yesterday. So one second has passed. So what I need to do is decrease this by the 32. So I'm going to go one and then 32 feet per second. So I'm going to go 1,000 minus 32 because only one second has passed. Is this 968? Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. 968. Now, when I get to the next line, how many seconds is that? Two. So how many times do I have to write 32? Twice. Yep. So I'm going to go 968 minus two copies of 32 because two seconds have passed and for each one needs to be accounted for. 904? Yes? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, let's do two more just so we have enough data to create that. Um, quadratic function. So then after three seconds, I'm going to go 904 minus three of these. I don't remember this one. So if someone could, thank you, 808. It might be sufficient. Do you have four of these? Yeah, we have four of them. I guess we could do one more just, just in case. The last one then. So after four, we're going to go 808 minus four copies of 32 feet per second. And again, that is called a gravitational constant. But you guys don't take physics yet anyways. You don't do much math with what you're doing, do you? Well, I guess the moles and joules calculations, right? I'm sure those are a fun time. So what's 808 minus four copies of the 32? Does anyone have that number? 680. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have enough information to find the model? Absolutely. So, we're going to now type this into L1, L2. So, type in the answer. L1, L2. And you are going to run our question on this again. And we determined that this is going to be number five quadratic regression. So number five is your quadratic regression. And to do the data, so you're going to hit stat and then edit 
and then highlight L1 and hit clear enter, highlight L2 and hit clear enter. Did anyone accidentally delete those yesterday and leave them back? Okay, it's not a big deal, but if you did, let me know. So L1, I'm going to go zero, one, two, three, and four, followed by 1,968, 808. Oh, I missed one. 904, 808, 680. Okay, so steps. Number five, quadratic regression, down, 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 enter. All right, did you guys get a function? Did it work out really nice? Yeah, it did, right? So we have y is equal to, again, ax squared plus ax plus b. And you're going to fill them in. And then we're going to work with this one a little bit further. We have y is equal to, I'm going to go negative 16x squared. Excuse me. Minus 16x plus 1,000. And that is our quadratic model. So just like that. Okay, so I added a part B. Excellent question. So what you're going to do is you would hit alpha and then DT on your numbers, how it says like L4, L5, L6, and then like L1, 2, 3. So you would just manually type in the other ones. Um, yeah, so you can definitely do that. We just find that it tends to be something you can struggle with, like changing the calculator around. So you usually would just have you clear them and just always use L1, L2. But yeah, if you wanted multiple to just keep multiple things in there as long as you reference the correct columns, then you're good. Yep. Yeah. Um, when we get to scatter stuff too, we'll be doing this in the next video as well. So you'll see that. So let us see ask you, how long is it going to take before she hits the ground? So where is the ground located at? Zero. What do you think I do with my equation? Possibly plug it in the so I'm going to have you do this algebraically instead. So I'm going to set it equal to zero. And what formula do you suppose I want you to use? Okay. Yep. Okay, it's good review, right? So yeah, we could put it in the calculator and find where it hits. But let's review quadratic formula since the opportunity has presented itself. So I'm going to go A, B, and C for my formula. And continue with this. So x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And I get here x is equal to um, 16 plus and minus the square root of, this is negative 16 squared minus 4 times negative 16 and then times 1,000 all over 2 times negative 16. Okay. Now, typically, we don't really have you guys round these. But in this capacity, because it's a word problem, your answer is going to make much more sense if it's actually like a rounded off answer because it's time in seconds. So you don't have to leave this in simple static form. Let's get your 10. So I'm going to have x equal to 16 plus and minus. And what do we get underneath this radical first? fifty-six. Thank you. Is that a perfect square? No. Okay. Let's say it kind of almost looks like it would be. Okay. So now we're going to take this and go a teeny bit further with it. And then it's a word problem. So keep that context in mind. How long till she hits the ground? 
Would it be reasonable for this to be negative? No. So we're only going to use a positive answer. So you're going to branch this off and you're going to solve both sides and figure out which one's positive, which one's negative here. So in your calculator, you're going to go 16 plus the square root of 64,240. 56 all over negative 32. Get an answer for this. I would recommend when you type this fraction that you hit alpha y equals enter to get the little fraction template. And then this one would be 16 minus all of that. 256 over negative 32. Okay. So let's see what we get from this. I hope you guys are already crossing your hand and got this. So the first side, 16 plus the square root of 54256 all over negative 32. This is my rejected answer. Did we get negative 8.4? And again, this is an answer you're going to reject because time can't be negative. Other answer? Could change this to a minus. And did we get like 7.4? Perfect. So that's a legitimate answer. So 7.4 seconds. And that is how long it takes until she hits the ground. All right. How do you guys feel with the quadratic modeling? Okay. Perfect. All right. Next one. An online ticket selling service charges $50 dollars for each ticket to an upcoming concert. In addition, the buyer has to pay sales tax at 8% and a convenience fee of $6 just because. What type of function is going to model this transaction? Linear. Yep. Anytime you buy stuff, you're going to be linear. Linear. It's a purchase. You can say that. And then linear, you can always justify by saying it has a constant rate of change. And we're going to find that right now. A constant rate of change. Find a model that is appropriate for this situation. Now, I see this in here. So tickets are the letter N instead of X. So when a question does make mention of those cases, you have to abide by it. So I'm going to go y is equal to, um, again, instead of mx plus b, I'm going to really use y is equal to, yeah. And then it looks weird to write that, you know? It does look odd. And it's just because of that reference to the n. So we know we have a flat b of 6. Where's the flat b go? Yeah. This is B, and I need to go and calculate my slope. So M is equal to, and use the shortcut, $50 and then tax. So again, instead of doing tax as two separate steps, all you need to do is essentially one plus 0 0.08, okay? Because it's increasing. So 50 times 1.08 is your price, including tax. Is this $54? Yes. Thank you, $54. All right, so our function, our model is going to be y is equal to, and we're going to go 54n plus 6. So that is your linear model. All right, so just like that one. All right, how do you feel here, okay? All right, flip over. Do you have one more on the back? I thought so. We have one more situation here on the back. represent a your initial starting value so that's there 
A child can soak a roll in a dye in the cup and adding one more to each cup for a dye that lands on. So this is one plus it increases, just like you've worked with exponentials in the past. And it lands with a one, two, or three stone. So, and we do a lot of probability, you know, after you guys return from spring break. So it's kind of a nice segue. If I roll a dice, I can get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six. Thus, what is the probability of obtaining a one, two, or a three? Exactly. So that's a 50% guarantee here, which means my rate for this question is gonna be one plus 0 0.50. And this is equal to my B value. Okay, so find a function that would expect to model through the data. I'm going to say f of t equals a value we established was 15. And then I'm going to go 1.5 or 3 halves. It makes no difference. Raise to the t. All right, so letter B. I gave you way too much time. So B, solve the equation for f of t equals 30. What does it mean? So f of t equals 30 means that the 30 goes right there. So 30 is equal to 15 times 1.5 raised to the t. This is a nice little review one, so that's why I wanted to do it. How do you guys solve this? What's the smartest thing to do first? Right. Yep. Divide by 15 first. So 30 divided by 15 means I am working with 2 equal to 1.5 to the t. So again, this pulls back prior knowledge. We wrote these with common bases when we started the unit. These obviously won't have common bases. We did work with reciprocals. That doesn't apply here either. You have two choices. You can rewrite this in a log equation or you can go power down the front all the both sides. So we can do it either way. I can do this log base 1.5 of 2 equals t. Or equivalently, I could go power down in front, log of 1.5, that's using your power rule, equal to log of 2. Guess what? They both give you the same answer. So you can pick whatever one you prefer here. And this one I would divide by the log of 1.5. And then the other one I would just type it in the calculator. And this is going to be the number of trials it would take for us to obtain the 30. All right, does anyone have an answer yet? I know the decimal. Uh, Seven. Yep, thank you. Let's go 1.7. So the 1.7 trials to reach a 30 value. Okay. How's that one? Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to change gears. And yesterday I handed you a review. So I handed you a document that looks like this on the front that has the graph. And all I figured we would do is go through some of these review problems. And then when you leave today, your assignment is to complete that test. And you can do that test that I handed you yesterday, however you'd like. If you wanna treat it like a real test, I'll have you like fake grade it when you come back after break. Or you can do it with your notes, of course, too. It's kind of up to you, but it's just extra practice. All right, so over to number one. So number one says, what are the domain and range of f? So I need to take this function and I need to graph it. All right, so you're gonna go right into your calculator. And I can go to range to the f and plus three. And what's gonna happen to this is this graph got shifted. 
You see how it moved up compared to the other ones you grabbed? Okay. So I'm going to ask just a couple guys. I don't want to respond. Did you guys get like negative one, like 3.5? And then I also have in here negative two and 3.25. And again, even though the decimals are somewhat cumbersome, they're so much more approaching, so that's why you want them. I have zero four. And then I have one five and two seven, six seven. All right, this is an exponential growth function, just like we looked at in your unit. So I'm going to just start and scoop it on up. And this first graph is half of x. It's an exponential growth function. What is the domain for a function that models this behavior? All the numbers, excellent. So you can say this in a variety of ways. I think what I use with you guys most often is I just said X was an element of the reals. If you don't love the notation, you can write it out in words too. If you like interval notation, you can do this. The more of those you see, the better. Okay, in this case, what's my range? What am I staying away from? I see where we're flatlining this time. Yeah. yeah. And why do you suppose that is? What does this graph do? Yeah, it shifted up three. So that's why it changed from zero. So I'm going to just simply say y such that y is greater than three. And again, it's because of that vertical shift upwards. That's the graph of the inverse function on your graph. So inverse means switch x and y. So I'm just going to do, I guess, a couple of these. We need to write the equation too. Let's do that first. So what's going to be the inverse of an exponential? A log. Yep. So let's write it first. Then you can use the calculator a little bit more to help you. So to write the inverse, I'm going to switch x and y. This is currently y. So I'm going to come right down here and go x equals 2 raised to the y and then plus 3. Oh, plus 3 goes down here, sorry. I'm going to solve for y equals. So I want to get the 3 to the other side. So I currently have x minus 3 is equal to 2 raised to the y. Now I'm going to rewrite this in logarithmic form. So I have the log base 2 of x minus 3 is equal to my inverse. Okay. So now you can write that in the calculator if you prefer. So I'm going to write this and then go math up to log base 2 and then x minus 3. And again, you're going to notice this first one. Where did this log graph shift? To the minus one to the right. So this went right three units. So my log graph looks like this now. And again, it's just because of the shift. And I'm going to just do this just so you've got part of it in here. That's enough to get our answers anyways. So this is the log base 2 of x minus 3. All right, what is the, the domain of the range for the inverse? Do you guys remember what they do? They do flip. Yep. So this domain, this is going to be hard to draw arrows to. My domain becomes my range. So I'm going to say y such that y is all reals. Because you do have to obviously change the x and the y part. 
And then I'm going to flip this one too. So my range becomes my domain. So now I'm going to say x such that x is greater than 3. And again, the only reason those change is because you applied transformations to your graphs. Okay. So how do the domain and range uh, relate? They flip or switch. Since inverses. So they flip since they are inverses. All right. The next thing we did in this unit is we found inverses algebraically. Um, if you look at A, you kind of like missing a letter there. I apologize. Um, someone pick. What do we want the letter to be? Sorry, I heard up first. Squeeze that in there. It like disappeared on me. I'm sorry. Find the inverse algebraically. If I start with E, what does this finish with? Natural log. Good. So E is the inverse function of natural log. And again, there's so many ways that you can write these. So on the left, I'm going to obviously change this to y equals first. And then step two to find an inverse is switch x and y. So x is equal to e raised to the y minus 2. And again, there's a lot of ways that you can write this. You can write it log base e. You can write it natural log. So this one, I'm going to do natural log of x equal to power down in front, natural log of e. And what happens with natural log of e? It cancels. So my answer is just natural log of x and then plus two. So my inverse, sorry, I'm a little too low there. F inverse x is equal to the natural log of x plus two. So I would just take the two and shift it over to the other side. All right, over to B. B, I think, is a little bit quicker and easier. So for letter B, what's going to be the inverse of a cube? Yep. So the cube is going to transform into a cube root instead. So like that. So I'm first going to change this to y equals. Step two, switch x and y. So I have x is equal to y minus 4, and then cubed, and then plus 1. Your next task is to solve for y equals. So I'm going to go minus 1, minus 1. So I get x minus 1 is equal to y minus 4 cubed. And then how do I undo this cube here? Yep, beautiful. Cube root and cube root. Okay, so I get x minus the cube root of x minus 1 is equal to y minus 4. And the last thing I want to do, obviously, here is get my y by itself. So what do I need to do to finish? Just add the 4. But just make sure when you go to write it that it's not in the root. So my answer, d inverse x is equal to the cube root of x minus 4 and plus 4. Okay, but again, it's all the way on the outside for that one. Okay, how do you guys feel with finding the inverses algebraically? Do we feel okay? Perfect. All right, let's go over them. Oh, where the floor is bottom? Oh, I'm sorry. No wonder this thing won't go down on me. Hold on. So, there we go. I'm sorry. I thought I would give you more of those. All right, so let us see. What is the inverse of a log? Yes, an exponent. Good. So these are inverse operations. So exponential form instead. 
So I change this to Y and then I switch X and Y. So this is log base two of three X minus seven. Thank you, three Y minus seven. Now I'm going to change this to exponential form. So this becomes what raised to what? Guys, remember? Subscript comes up and then these two, which? So it becomes two raised to the X is equal to three Y minus seven. And it's always that first step that tends to be the hardest to do. Now I get Y by itself. So I'm gonna add the seven over. Just be careful where you place it. It is not included in the exponent. And then how do I get the Y by itself from here? Yep, divide by three and done. Again, most of these, the hardest thing is to get them started. So my answer is J inverse X is equal to two raised to the X plus seven all over the three. Okay. And then letter D. Letter D, I don't really have like a scenario to tell you other than when you see a repeated variable, this is the type you're gonna have to factor for. So I'm gonna switch X and Y to give me X is equal to five plus Y divided by six minus two Y. I'm gonna place this over one cross multiply and solve. So just like that. So cross multiply, I get a six X minus two X Y's equal to five plus Y. And then I need to solve for Y. So it's easiest if I get my Y's on the same side and know it doesn't matter what side that is. So let's get rid of the negative two X Y, because why not? So I'm gonna add the two X Y over. So add that over. At the same time, you can move the five too. So I'm gonna have a six X minus five equal to a two X Y plus Y. And then what I do is I GCF my Y out, allowing me to isolate two X plus one, and then I can divide that over. So six X minus the five, and then all you have to do is divide it over. So I divide by the two X plus one, and I'm gonna leave it at that. So divide, divide, and on. Okay, so my final answer is to use proper inverse notation. And I'm going to say F inverse X is equal to uh, 6X minus 5 divided by 2X plus 1. All right, how do you guys feel with those inverses, okay? Oh, uh, you have four of them? Okay. All right, some graphing. We're going to skip around a little bit, I think, too. Some scenarios and some graphing. A potato is fired into the air on the field during physics class. They actually usually do this quite a bit in the spring, but obviously, I don't think you guys are really doing science labs like that anymore, are you? Yeah. The potato's height is given by the formula. What type of function models a potato getting fired into the air? Yep, very good. That's it, that's all you have to say on that one. Again, it's a projectile question. And I also gave you the equation, which has a squared in it. So 44 times, four, sorry. Ticketmaster charges $88 per ticket to a concert. In addition, you have to pay 8.5% sales tax and a convenience fee. All right, we just did it a second ago. What type of function is ticket sales? Find a model, we're gonna go y equals mx plus b again. 
but I'm going to change it to n again because the question did state that. So y is equal to, and I'm going to go n times n plus b. All right, my b value is 13. So plus 13. My m value is going to be $88. In sales tax, I'm going to go one plus 0 0.085. And then plus the 13. Let me fix this a little bit. So this is one plus 0 0.085 and, and plus 13. Can someone grab me this number? 95.48. 95.48, thank you. And N plus 13. Awesome. So find that. Write the function in general form and explain how it's a transformation. You guys are no longer responsible for general form. You may me. Now, number six. Even though it says to write it in general form, ignore that part, and you're going to do this instead. Explain how it's a transformation. So ignore this part, and think about your rules instead. How do we rewrite division? What does division become? Subtraction. And that exposes what transformation took place. So I take this and I break it up. So I go log base 2 of x minus log base 2 of 16. And now this goes into your graphing calculator. And what do we get for our value? Oh, it's going to be kind of nice. Yeah. So I have the log base 2 of x minus 4. Now, didn't you write this in terms of a vertical transformation? Mm -hmm. What is this telling you that you're graphing? Excellent, it shifted down by four. So for those type of questions, that's all you guys have to say. So you just use your log rules and split it, and then you're able to state that this went down four. So seven you may eliminate. But your test, I already caught all of those and changed them. So don't worry that those problems won't give you any, anything with general form in it. They just get written like that. All right, describe the transformation that occurs here. So we're going to do the same type of thing just to, again, make you practice the rules. So if I have a product, what does a product become? Addition, yep. So product equals addition. You don't have to worry about the graphs. I think we can handle doing graphs with the calculator. So working with this side, I'm going to say g of x equals the log base 2 of 32 plus the log base 2 of x. So what is the log base 2 of 32? Yep, very good. This is 5. So I'm going to go g of x is equal to. I'm just going to flip it. You don't have to do this. But what this allows me to do is just kind of easy, easily see those transformations. So what could we say that this graph is going to do? Yep, very good. It's going to shift up. So if a question asks you for a vertical transformation, you would say up and down. If this question asks you, what is this going to do horizontally? You would look inside here. And when I have horizontal, it always works opposite. So I could also equivalently state that this is going to be a horizontal, think opposite, shrink, by 1 over 32. So those are equivalent transformations that we did show. So this is a horizontal shrink by 
1 over 32. So this transformation is equivalent to this transformation. Okay, so it's just working with your rules. I'm going to stop there because the graphing I think we're pretty good with, right? Yeah, you guys just use your calculators to do that. So let me explain what I would like you to complete between now and when you return, and then you can have the rest of the time. So your assignment, remember the talk we handed you yesterday? That is what I would like you to complete between now and when you return. Um, you guys have Monday off. So you return on April, is it 6th? Yeah, I think it's something like the 6th. Correct. Yes. So I would like you to complete that test um, by the time you return to class next, the next next Tuesday, which is April 6th. You don't need to submit anything electronically between now and then. Those I will just come around and check when you guys return. And you are free to try to do that like a real test if you would like, because when you return on the Tuesday, I'll put your answers up and we'll go through them. And if you want, I'd be happy to tell you kind of like how to score them. But that's it. We kind of need to give you a little bit of a break. Um, and our plan is for, yeah, we'll kind of feel things out and see how the Wednesday goes as well. I'm thinking what else you guys might have questions on. There are no, yep. As it stands right now, the information I just sent this morning says that for Algebra 2, you will not, as long as you're passing, which we're good. <laughs> Just maintain your passing average and you should be okay. Yes. I can't speak to science though. What's up? That's a good question. <laughs> we, meet, we meet a lot, like we're meeting again tomorrow too, but we have so many, we haven't even gotten that far yet. We're trying to figure out still what to do after break. So as soon as I know, I'll tell you though. Absolutely, but you should plan on your last day of school is June 11th, your last day of class, okay? No, that's normal. Yeah, because two weeks of regents. Yep, absolutely. And guys, there are no office hours this week. So anything you have questions or concerns on, please just write down and you know you can absolutely ask when you return to class Tuesday after break. And I hope you were able to enjoy your break too. I wish this weather would stick. Unfortunately, it's not going to, though. <laughs>